Hello. Hey, Ron, it's Eric from Locals Only. How are you? Fine, Eric. How are you? Hey, good. I'll be pulling up in front of the cannery in just about uh, 30 seconds. If you want to come out, I'm in a white Mercedes. Hey, welcome to Locals Only. I'm Eric Hale. And if you don't know me, I'm the guy that founded Locale Magazine 14 years ago in my garage. It's been my job for all those years to tell you the coolest places to eat in all of Southern California, fun things to do so you have date nights that aren't boring, and we've talked to some really interesting people. Now we have a podcast, and we're lucky enough to call this Mercedes-Benz EQE all-electric sedan, courtesy of Fletcher Jones Motorcars in Newport Beach, our mobile podcast studio. So sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the conversation. Welcome to Locale Zone. Today, we're cruising down the Newport Beach Peninsula with Ron Salisbury. Ron's family opened El Cholo a hundred years ago, and he still owns that, plus the cannery and Louis on the Bay. And at 90 years old, he's opened up two new restaurants just this year. Today, we're going to talk about his love of baseball. We'll talk about the history of his restaurants and how his letter writing campaign got him to be friends with a lot of really cool celebrities. So sit back, buckle up, and enjoy Locals Only. We're with uh, Ron Salisbury. Uh, Ron is the owner of quite a few things. Um, El Cholo restaurant chain, which has been around for just over a hundred years now. We just picked him up at the cannery, which is here in Newport Beach. He also has Louie's yeah. uh, right across the bay. And? In the cannery. In the cannery. And yeah. we just opened a new restaurant called uh, El Gato, which we had a restaurant for 41 years up in La Habra. And it was a fine dining restaurant. We kind of ran out of the neighborhood changed. And uh, so we put in a uh, medium priced uh, Italian restaurant. That oh, just opened. Wonderful. So then and, and we're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Well, anyway. you just opened also a restaurant in Utah, too. Yeah, that, but that's seven months ago now. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. I, if a lot of our listeners don't know, Ron just... You can't tell it by the way he looks. Just <laughs> celebrated his 90th birthday uh, a few months back, but you're still opening restaurant after restaurant. You're, you might be one of the few people that have opened two restaurants uh, right around your 90th birthday, <laughs> wouldn't you say? Well, I don't feel 90, and uh, I feel like life just goes on. This is what I've always done. People say, why are you doing it? That's what I've always done. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can just go back a little bit, because I think you have a pretty interesting story. Not too many people go back. 90 years into the LA restaurant scene. Your El Cholo restaurant was started by your parents. It was grandparents. My grandparents. Grand, my grandparents okay. had the first one that was over by the LA Coliseum on two streets were, were called Manita and Santa Barbara, which okay. now is Broadway and Martin Luther King. Okay. And then okay. it goes back that far. Yeah, and then my uh, four years into it, my dad walked, my mother was a, a server there. My dad walked in, had lunch, met my mom, and they decided because they were well, my dad quit in the fifth grade because he was the sole money earner for his family. And his mother was a widow. And so they, they needed to, you know, the depression and they needed to do something which would give them a good life and something they could be proud of. And they opened their own El Cholo uh, concurrently with my grandparents. That's a that's a long history there. And and the the restaurant that they opened, it's it's close by. It's right across the street from the original house. Uh, yes, the one the one on the way opened on Western Avenue, and they, they just went to a little storefront. They had the uh, three booths, wooden booths, and then a counter, and that was it. And then the uh, typical California bungalows, which is which was what they were building in those days. One of those came for sale across the street, and my dad bought it. And everybody told him he's get crazy because he's going to spoil this <laughs> great little restaurant he had moving. And then the house was really. Uh, you know, the, one of the one of the uh, dining rooms was the former living room. One was the dining room. One was the kitchen, and then there's two bedrooms in it. And we had one bathroom which had a tub in it. And so for many years, the, uh, the key story, the bathroom, which was became the women's room, um, had a bathtub in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's the same restaurant you can go to today. Correct. So yeah. Still in that house. Yeah. My grand, a little different. My grandparents won. Uh, yeah, it, my uh, older. My mother's older sister took it over after my grandparents could, no longer could. And then she sold it in 1950 and it disappeared. So yeah, right now we kind of say the original is the one on Western still there. And, and where did that, where did your uh, grandparents' recipes come from? Because my grandmother at that time, <laughs> like right, in, in, in 100 years ago in LA, I think the sign out front even says 
Spanish food. Correct. Uh, because people had a, a negative connotation about Mexican or Hispanic food. You're right. If you, you, you would not call your food Mexicans, it was perceived as not healthy or as sanitary. So on that reason, today they have open kitchens. My dad had an open kitchen so people could look in it for that very reason, so we could see how clean and well kept up it was. And the recipes go back to my grandmother, and I feel very fortunate because the old typical story again, they were, they were a young couple that came from the territory of Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, over dirt roads in a car that probably traveled 20 miles an hour. I can't picture how it was. <laughs> and they came to Los Angeles with the sole purpose of creating a little business they could be proud of and they could give them good living. And uh, so then they arrived here and my one night, my grandfather pushed back from the dinner table and said, uh, you're such a good cook. Let's let's just open a restaurant. And to That's my good famous last words for a lot of restaurants. Yeah, yeah, famous last words. But yeah. my fortunate thing was she was a great cook. Yeah, and we stayed true to her um, her recipes all these years. What were some of your favorites that your grandma used to make you? Well, you know, back then the menu was very simple. It's either inch, cheese enchilada, chili relleno, uh, tamale, or uh, relleno. Yeah. Taco, I'm sorry. So, taco. yeah, and so the menu we, we now created for our 100th anniversary a really large plate that puts those four items on there with beans and rice, which is really the original menu we had all on one plate. We call it Tasty History. Yeah, and then you you've taken that one location um, in your generation, and you've made multiple locations. So I, let's let's move away from the restaurants a little bit. We can come back and maybe talk about the cannery. Sure, I think that's a really interesting story as well. But um, let's talk about you a little bit. I think I, we, we know each other personally. And one of the things that I find really endearing about you is some of the relationships that you've made over the years with people that you admire. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how you started reaching out to these people that you admire and some of those people that you've uh, made contact with. Well, first of all, there's so many people come to the restaurant. They just, it's afforded me the opportunity to get to know. I get to know people from all walks of life, all interesting things. and. Uh, that alone has provided me some wonderful, wonderful friends and wonderful experiences. The other one I reached out, I mean, when you have a restaurant, it's kind of easier to reach out to people because they identify the restaurant. I mean, Ray Bradbury was a someone I had really respected from a long distance and yeah. wrote to him one time and great, said, Great writer. Yeah, and I thought uh, he had he'd spoken in downtown LA and there was a bunch of things where all the great minds came together. The only one I remember was his talk because he yeah. talked about what he called the Yellow Brick Road to revitalize downtown where you'd leave your work and you follow the yellow brick road just hit this place then you'd have cocktails in here and then you move to, to the bookstore and, and you know he had a great imagination and a great vision and i so enjoyed his talk i wrote to him i said you know i'd like to have dinner with you and just get to hear more about it and out of that came a really deep friendship and he would write poetry and he'd send it to me what do you think and I wrote it just a, started with a letter. So just a letter. Kids, if you're listening, a letter is just like something huh. you write on paper with a pen or a pencil. If you haven't seen one of those, and you put it in the post office box and you wrote back. Exactly. And I, you know, I mean, if you do that, you don't expect to hear back. Right. So you don't expect to. On the flip side, you might just make a connection. You might even have a, an incredible experience one time with somebody like that or it even grows into a lifelong friendship. So you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I tell people about this. I say, who would you like to meet? They'll give me the name. I'll say, write them a letter. They never do. I've never had one person tell me to do it. Let's go into your love of baseball. So if you haven't been into, let's say, the cannery in Newport Beach, definitely yeah. should go. It's one of our favorite restaurants. Thank you. My wife and I, it's close to our house. Uh, but you have a kind of a mini uh, Hall of Fame, Baseball Hall of Fame, just in your lobby. You have checks signed by, I think, Babe Ruth. You have lots of balls. Ty, Ty Cobb, balls. yeah. Oh, Ty Cobb, sorry. Lots and, of And great, and Babe Ruth, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just great artifacts in this museum. Um, and you started doing this uh, hot stove uh, series, right? Yeah, well, so around the baseball season when they're doing all the trades. And how, how did that come about? Well, I thought I thought the cannery was going to be my last restaurant. I was 69 years old, and and that again by itself is an amazing story how they came about. But so we had this seafood restaurant, and I thought huh, since it's the last restaurant, how can I kind of weave some baseball into it? And then I thought in the old man in the sea, when the old man is coming back and the sharks have devoured his great catch, he says to himself, I must think, because that's all I have left, which is a great line. Yeah. And then dot, 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 he says, 
bad in baseball. And I thought, well, no, not many people had caught that bad. I thought, oh, that's my opening. I'm old man, C, baseball. So we put that over the host desk. And then I thought, my wife gave me a few years back a signed check by Ty Cobb. I thought, well, let me start collecting it's because the restaurant is not about current athletes and who are there. Right. The, it, that restaurant is about the greatest that ever lived, tradition, um, and the greatest that ever played the game. And I thought that represents hopefully what that restaurant can become. So I started collecting other pictures and memorabilia and putting them up in the in the room. Now let's get around to the cannery because I think there's a lot of people that might listen to this that have eaten at the cannery. But uh, probably a lot of people um, don't know its history. Right, I live on the hill, just there in Newport Heights. Uh -huh. uh, you can almost see the cannery uh, from where I live. But there's a whole story and a backstory about it. It was a working cannery for a long time, and actually the neighborhood I lived in housed a lot of the workers, right? Okay, right. Maybe tell me the story a little bit about the cannery okay. and how you ended well, up acquiring that. Well, as you point out, in 1922, it was a, a cannery along with many other canneries back there in, in the Bay. Uh, 1972, a very enterprising a uh, gentleman gathered some friends together and they said, let's build a restaurant in this cannery building. And it, it became the cannery and was from 1972 to 1999. It was a, a kind of a classic restaurant on the Bay and really had created, restaurant created Bay memories. Um, 1999, they sold the property and it was gonna be torn down and developed into just, a, this, this is one of my greatest stories yeah. ever. It, <laughs> I, I love telling it. Um, is being torn down and developed into condominiums just like everything else around there and right. a man i did not know at the time he developed bear paints b-e-h-r uh he never ate in the cannery but he said you know i can't see my neighborhood losing an iconic landmark restaurant wow. so he went out and paid three times what it was worth to, to set to save it and i met jack and jack said i'll give you whatever money it takes to, be, to put it together i thought well why not? And uh, I, you know, I went from El Cholo, which I say are uh, they're like soloists, having to play their instrument very to perfection, to a restaurant which is like a symphony orchestra. It's yeah. com complicated and complex, but it gave me at the age of 69 a renewed opportunity to learn new things, fresh new things, make some mistakes, and grow and meet new people. So it was it's been amazing in my life. So anyway, Jack gave us. Well, they gave us $800,000 and uh, it wasn't enough because the restaurant was really in bad, bad shape. So a little bit, and Jack had only met me half a dozen times. We're walking through one day and he says, oh, this has to be costing you more of the money I gave you. <laughs> and I said, well, Jack, yes, it is. Uh, also, he pulls a checkbook out of his pocket. <laughs> Who cares checkbook? He writes me a check for $500,000. Wow. And I knew it was for. And this is also, I mean, this is 20 years ago. These numbers we're talking about yeah. were a lot bigger, but he was really so dedicated to having his community keep that restaurant. Yeah, and, and, but he, he didn't really know me. That's the thing. Oh, he yeah. didn't know me. Right. And so he writes and he said, I, I said, what's this for? I knew it was for. He said, it's, you need more money. Here it is. I said, Jack, we can't take it. We have a, a deal. <laughs> he said, I insist you take it. I said, well, you insist we'll take it. I said, but we're raising money through investors. Oh, do you have some room left in investors? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, yeah, and he says, can I have $700,000 of that? Oh my goodness. So in the space of 60 seconds, the man gives me $1.2 million. Wow. Who, to a person he didn't really know, who in most, in the restaurant business, you know, most restaurants don't last very long. Right. And more likelihood, this restaurant's gonna be out of business in a few years. Right. He trusts me that kind of money. Oh, wow. But Jack has an amazing insight. One aside, I asked him one time, how did you run a company as big as Bear? He said, I simply told everybody when they come to me with a situation, I said, you know what? Just do the right thing. I said, that's all he told them. He said, and then they had to go back and think, what is the right thing? And he says, the company ran smoothly. And he said, that's I, such simple advice and great advice for yeah. business owners to yeah. maybe not be so, exactly. great advice for yeah. me, maybe not be so involved, but say, do the right thing. And involve the person, they owned it, yeah. they, they grew from doing it. It was a, and that's why he's such a great person. And uh, But now I have to say, he wasn't just giving the money to anybody that he just met. No. You had about 50 years experience running uh, restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but, he, but, he, had, he had a good feeling yeah. about you too. But there's people, give me a million and a half and I'm running off to Argentina, you know. Oh, right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, on the other side, we're sitting in the attorney's office and the attorney says, Jack, you need this in the lease. 
And Jack turns to me and says, if that's in lease, does it make it harder for you to operate? And I said, well, of course it does. Then I don't want it in lease. <laughs> so you get you get the picture and, and he was just, uh, it's just a, it's an incredible story. I'm incredibly blessed to have this happen in my life. It changed my life. It introduced me, made me feel more a part of the community. It introduced me all these wonderful people that I never would have met if the restaurant wasn't there. It was just, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy. I mean, we've just gone through, you, you, you've got to meet your idols. You've uh, had this restaurant, yeah. you've had this longevity of life. and. And you've also uh, got to do things that make you really happy and yeah. be successful. I mean, those yeah. are all testaments to a life well lived. Yeah. And a couple of other I'll toss in. David Halberstam was an author, Pulitzer Prize winning author, has written some great history books. And I was just enthralled with his writing because uh, you, when you, some people you read, you can skip. I couldn't skip. I had to hang on to every word when he writes. Wrote to him for five years in a row, never heard from him. All of a sudden, I'm in the hospital with bleeding ulcers, and he calls the office. This, he said, Ron has been trying to get hold of me for five years to have dinner. I'm in town. Is he still interested? And they called me. He said, I said, I'm leaving the hospital. <laughs> and so we sat at the, in the patio at the cannery one night, and I just sat. I didn't talk much. I just listened. But I hear I had a chance to spend an evening with David telling about it. He was a war correspondent telling all his brilliant guy i got to meet him we were starting to develop a friendship and he was t-boned in an intersection one time and killed shortly after did that spur you to write your book because i know no, I, I I your book and you have the book <laughs> about the uh everything they didn't teach you at the cia oh. but that's kind of a <laughs> well, that cheeky, was fun. cheeky title right yeah it was fun but i wrote the book because i just thought you know as you can tell I, I like to tell stories i've got some stories i love to tell and so i just put them into a book and that's now the CIA, and for those of you guys uh, that are listening, uh, it's not for the CIA, it's for the Culinary Institute right, of America. Right. And, and knowing Ron for a long time, I would say maybe 15 years ago, Ron and I went on a drive and we were talking restaurants. And I was a lot younger then, and I was chipping in with all these <laughs> ideas as I normally do. And it was the first time uh, I think I had a conversation with somebody just because of your years of wisdom where every idea I threw out, you said, tried that already, done that, tried that. Did I really? Yeah, but, yeah, but, it, was, but it was, I think it was humbling to me in a certain extent, but it was yeah. also good to see what wisdom was, right? It's that, that, well, it's that accumulation of knowledge. It's not just being smart. Well, it's, it's common able sense. To learn lessons. <laughs> and common sense comes from probably learning lessons yeah. in good ways and bad ways, right? So so that's all, that's all the book is. It's just yeah. a bunch of whole common sense ideas that make you think through differently. It's a, for instance, I got held up one time and the guy had a gun to my head and he says, take me to the safe. And all I could think of was, <laughs> I wish I had a second safe because <laughs> because if I had a second safe, I would put the real money in the second safe. Yeah. I would have token money in the first one because nobody says, now that we have opened your first safe, let's go to the second <laughs> safe. It's just, it's such a witty, you know, or things how to operate the restaurant. Uh, yeah. and I, so, I would have recommended to anybody that's looking in, getting in the restaurant business also probably get a psych psychiatric evaluation nowadays yeah. if you're looking to get into it but had a lot of fun really funny read uh you can you can get that book um so we're about to the end of our ride here uh but maybe you know maybe talk about um at 90 right yeah you've accomplished a lot uh, i've had a great life what else do you want to accomplish is what what is what it, and it might not be a thing but what else is there left for you to do that you're really excited I've, about to get you up every morning because you guys can see him on camera, Ron gets up, he's driving around in his nice car, he's at his restaurant, he's working. I mean, sometimes long shifts. Like, what's that motivational factor? What are you still trying to achieve? Well, I think the, we had the 100th anniversary for the restaurant and I always get up in the morning thinking, what am I gonna deal with today and what does tomorrow mean? And I never looked back and appreciate it. So one of the most frequently asked questions at our hunter is looking back what do you see and enjoy? And I looked back and I started, oh my gosh, there's so much richness here in the stories we have to tell, what this restaurant it means to people. I've had, we, the restaurant in Salt Lake we opened and I had people gripping my hands, crying because they moved to Utah, thought they'd never go to El Cholo again. And now El Cholo's there. And it's a very emotional, we've had five generations eating with us. And the stories, I spent the first three weeks just going from table to table, having people look at me and tell me how much the restaurant meant to them. It wasn't just a restaurant, it was part of their life. And so I realized that with this, this the, we, really, we really created something. So let's just try and use that to do something even more. So it's a little complicated. Um, 
we, we dedicated to raise a million dollars for pediatric cancer research. And one of the things we did was to sell naming rights, permanent naming rights and brass plaque to some of our iconic booths. Uh, we've done other things, we had fundraise, but anyway, so then I thought, well, I think we should now not only just be happy to do this for one year, from now on, our second hundred years, we're going to take a, a charity or a cause every year and we'll name it, we'll dedicate it to help that cause through raising money for it and bringing awareness to it. So we can do that is because we, you know, people believe in us, it's more, more than just a restaurant. I want to turn the restaurant into a second, a next school, because I think people graduate from school, they get a job, and now it's just, I'll do the job, here's your paycheck, and go home. And I've seen the opportunity to work with younger people or people that we can teach them, this is their next school. I view it, we're in the next school, and I want to do everything we can to turn this next school. We have, we started a few years ago, I, I like to read a lot, and I like to read a lot of books that I feel are helpful for you to read, will really change your life in little ways. And so we started rewarding people. If you would read the book and write me a two pages what you learned from the book. A book report. Book report, I'll give you $100. Wow. We even had one, one young man in the Santa Monica restaurant read all the books and took that money and he had a cheap vacation, but he went to Europe and traveled and, because he earned the money. So. I, I, that's the start of it. So we want to encourage people to continue to learn at the book board. That I want to turn it as much as possible that we will figure out ways to make this a school which which we introduce people to new thoughts, new ways to live, things that will make them better. So we become the next school. And I think we can help society, which is in a mess today. Um, maybe in our way we can help make it better. And so we're going to encourage, ed, besides the charities, we're going to encourage education that you learn, and we're going to award some scholarships to children of people who work for us. There will be great scholarships, but there will be scholarships to continue to learn. So we're encouraging continuing education. Uh, it's, a lot of people say, I have a dream. I, I was in a place the other day that said, dream and keep dreaming your dream until it that comes about. And I think, you know, that's not, <laughs> that doesn't work the way. <laughs> you exactly have to be, how it works. You, no, no. <laughs> and I thought, but people have dreams, and to, to come, you know, I had a dream of, meeting Emmy Lou Harris, they're meeting these people. It happened and how my richer my life is for it. So we want to we maybe take a couple of people, you submit your dreams and we'll sponsor you to to do your dream. And then you can go back and tell you, yeah, you know what? I actually did it, it actually happened. And when you achieve your dream, look how much richer your life is. So then we can encourage people to, re to dream big and accomplish it. And the third one is to do good. You know, there's a lot of causes. I know some people who they take groups to Guatemala and dig water wells for the people. And so we'll sponsor people to go down and to do some of these things. And they can come back and tell everybody, you know, I was in Guatemala and you think you think you have it bad here? You know, and, and so I did, th together we can maybe make the world a better place. And that's, and I think we can do that because we've, over the years, we've dealt a lot of relationships, trust, hopefully people respect us and we have some clout to make this happen. So that's that's kind of my big one. I, I think that's a, a great goal for your next 90 years, Ron. Uh, I just want to say, I want to thank you for being, you know, acquaintance and <laughs> sometimes friend over the last 15 years, <laughs> well, you, having I, lunches with you and getting to know you. You definitely enriched my life, well, uh, been a mentor. So thank you for being on the show today. <laughs> I want to thank Ron Salisbury for joining us today on Locales Only. I want to thank everyone on the Straw Hut media team, including executive producer Ryan Tillotson and our editor and producer Parker J. Hicks. And as always, a big thank you to Fletcher Jones Motor Cars in Newport Beach for providing this beautiful Mercedes-Benz EQE to be our rolling podcast studio. Join us next time on Locales Only, where you can buckle up and go for a ride in our mobile podcast studio with some of the coolest people in Southern California. Yeah.